Our epistle lesson for today is from 1 John chapter 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him. For we will see Him as He is. And all who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as God is righteous. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God. Nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wrote an article for the Soul Food this week in which I revealed to you the, the, the time of my life in which I, something very strange happened. Something strange had already happened because I had gone to seminary and had had no plans for such a thing. It never occurred to me. It wasn't part of my plan. And uh, I wasn't even particularly re religious when I went to seminary, but, but uh, it just felt like the thing I was supposed to do, and so I did it. So then I finished seminary and, and uh, was preparing to, no, had already begun my doctoral work in, in uh, economic anthropology. And I had this odd thing popped in my head. Now, I had never been athletic as a young person. I never cared much about sports. I was always the teacher's pet. Uh, but uh, never, not very, very good on the playground, not very good at sports. But this idea came into my head that I should be a boxer. A boxer, yeah. Jab, cross, hook. Now, what in the world? I mean, no, this was the strange thing. Now, and my, nobody understood this, right? My parents, of course, were horrified. What do you mean? But it just, I just had to, and so I did. And so I became involved eventually, in a roundabout way, I became involved in this team called Supreme Team Boxing in New York. And the Supreme Team was a group of teenagers who had been in trouble, teenagers who had had a very hard life, many of them coming out of juvenile detention or at risk of being put in juvenile detention, and they had found this activity of amateur boxing as a way to build a new life, to rebuild themselves, their sense of what it means to be men in the world, their sense about how to get along and how to deal with your anger and how to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And I learned from them, and I hope they learned a little from me. It was the strangest thing. I was the only white guy and the only old guy on the team. But I fought in the New York Golden Gloves. <laughs> And, and those particular experiences could not possibly have come from anything else, no matter how much I had planned it. Nothing I could have planned could have given me those experiences. And so I've come to start to trust my sense of where the Holy Spirit is calling me. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. Usually it doesn't make sense. And a lot of times where the Holy Spirit calls us is to places that are inconvenient. They don't match up with our plans. They certainly don't match up with the, 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 what the world tells us we should be doing. The Holy Spirit calls us into new and strange places, places in which we 
do have to set aside what the values that we had had, what we had thought we would do with our lives sometimes. The Holy Spirit calls us into these new places. And the faithful thing, of course, is to obey. I wonder what the, the apostles thought when this strange guy who was, looked a little ragged, a little worse for the wear, came along, about 30 years old, came along and said, you know, they were fishing. And they said, now ignore everything you think you're supposed to do. Put down your nets and follow me. Ignore your, what you think are your financial responsibilities. Drop it. Walk away from what you think is your career and follow me. What an... I wonder if I would be willing... I wonder how many people would be willing to do that if Jesus came along and told us to go somewhere new. So, over the last month or so, we've had these scriptures that... There seems to be a theme. And... Every week, these scriptures seem to bring us uh, uh, certain messages, and they're the same messages in slightly different ways. And so when I looked at the scripture for this week, the lectionary scripture, there were several to choose from. But I looked at the scripture from 1 John, the the first letter of John, and I thought, oh, no, there it is again. And so I thought, oh, I'll just choose the, the passage from Luke to preach about but then I thought, wait a minute, this is something is, we're being told something here. Again, the, the lectionary scripture brings a message to me which seems to reaffirm things that we've been learning for the last month, really, ever since the beginning of Lent. And so I thought, I can't walk away from that. This is clearly something that needs, I need to pay attention to. And so what are the messages that we've been getting? First that the truth of God is not to be compartmentalized. This is something I've said here before from the pulpit. That is to say that a a common pattern in Christianity in the United States is to talk all about God on Sundays, of course, and a couple of times throughout the week, but of course, God has nothing to do with our work lives. We could be firmly convinced about the values that God calls us to practice but it doesn't count at the office, right? It doesn't count. Certainly, it doesn't count in the voting booth. We're not supposed to even think about God in the voting booth and vice versa. What the scriptures have brought to us several times over these last few weeks is that the truth of God is to be taken everywhere. It belongs everywhere in our lives, in our bedrooms and, and homes, in our families, in the workplaces, and yes, in the voting booth, we're not to say, gee, God, I know what you have told us about how we should live, but you don't understand, really, the current picture. So I'm going to have to leave you outside of the voting booth. No, God belongs everywhere. So that's one of these messages that we've heard again. Secondly, there is a sharp moral difference in the scripture, that their scriptures have presented to us Two ways of being in the world, two different kingdoms. It was one week, and another week it was self versus others. And again in 1 John, we're going to encounter the same idea that the values of God, the truth of God, is so fundamentally opposed to the values of this world that we cannot stand between and say, Uh, I'll decide later. We can't be neutral. There is a sharp difference, and we're called to choose. The third, uh, 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 thirdly, that this choice is, we are called to make this choice, and it is clear in the scriptures. The scriptures do not present ambiguity to us. We are called to make a choice. And finally, that neutrality is not an option. So these are the things that we've been engaging with ever since the beginning of Lent. And these are the messages that, again, the first letter of John brings to us. So let's look at that first letter of John. The first, second, and third John are are fascinating documents. Um, They are, they probably emerged from what we 
northern Palestine, which we now call Syria. And they uh, emerge from the tradition from the cluster of churches who were founded based on the stories told initially by John the Apostle, John the one whom Jesus loved, the scripture tells us. Of course, 1 John wasn't written by John, it was written uh, probably around 90 or 100, so that would be 70 or 65 years after Jesus' death, long after John the Apostle had died, but his teaching continued in these churches in northern Palestine, and this is probably the source for this letter that reiterates, wants to tell us again and, and frame for us the messages of the gospel according to John. And so in some ways, it's a retelling of the gospel according to John. Now, there are a few things that are about these three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, that are important, really important for our purposes. So let's look at them. First of all, the inseparability of faith and moral conduct. This is where so many of us go wrong, right? We think we can have faith, and if we sin, it's okay, because... God will forgive us. So we, we're not too concerned about our conduct in the meantime during the week. We're not too concerned. But 1 John insists that faith and moral conduct cannot be separated. They are inseparable. Religious experience cannot be divorced from moral conduct in this earth. Who we are in relation to other people and in relation to our world cannot be something different than who we are in relation to God. In fact, it doesn't work, right? You can't do it that way. We can't claim to love God and hate our neighbor. We can't claim to love God and hate God's creation or destroy it. We can't claim to be, we can't pray to the Prince of Peace and yet be violent in our lives. Yes, even in our work lives, even in our political lives. Moral conduct cannot be separated from the truth of God. Therefore, when John, when first John uses these phrases to describe what it means to be a Christian, he uses the phrases being born of God, being a child of God, knowing God, abiding in God. None of these things refer merely to an internal mystical state or thought process or faith or something we think. None of these things refer only toward an internal condition, but they are concretely manifested in doing what is right. Obeying the commandments, walking as Jesus walked, being the people that God has called us to be. And so what we do matters. It matters. Secondly, there is clearly, there is a clear moral imperative in 1 John. In fact, 1 John uses this phrase, children of the devil, abide in death. Did you hear the, the differentiation between children of God and children of the devil? This is, uh, this is not an ambiguous scripture. This is not one in which we're told, well, sometimes we mess up, sometimes we do well. This is a scripture which really calls us to make a clear choice. Whose children do we wish to be? And finally, in 1 John and 2 and 3 John, there is an eschatological expectation. What that means is eschatology refers to thinking about the end times, thinking about the parousia, which is the return of Jesus, thinking about when this current world order will end. That's what eschatology is. And in 1 John, there is an eschatological Catalogical expectation, which is to say that John says to the people, uh, children, it is the last hour. Which is to say, don't take too long making this decision. <laughs> don't take too long. You need to figure this out quickly because it's time. It's time to make that choice. It's time to make the decision. There is our clear there are children of God and children of the devil. And there is behavior which reflects the values that God has brought to us. And there is behavior which mocks God. 
and God is not to be mocked. God is not to be mocked, not in our offices, not in the voting booth, not in our churches. God is not to be mocked. So, let's look at the particular passages that we've read today. First, the reason that the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The world did not know us. What does that mean? It means that the values of this world, the worldview of dominant society, the way that things are set up in our world, are so fundamentally opposed to who we are and who Christ is and who God has called us to be that the world doesn't, cannot even see the truth. The world, meaning that set of values and, and systems and behaviors which reject the truth of God, cannot even approach, cannot even recognize when God is present. And this is why John says, the world did not know him. Because God cannot even be recognized in a world which looks only at the darkness and which celebrates the darkness, which celebrates greed and violence and hatred. A world such as that does not know the Christ, says 1 John. And next we read, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Meaning that when Christ is revealed, we will be like him. This is a, a theme throughout 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the kinship with God. The idea is that we are, that we become truly God's children, not just rhetorically, but we become brothers with Christ. And so when Christ is revealed, we will be like him. So there's an eschatological element here that says, in the end time, when Jesus comes, then we'll be like him. But there is also here, very clearly, uh, an insistence that we shouldn't wait till then. That we need to do our jobs now, which is to choose the way of God, the way of what is right, the way of what is good. And this is, this is an urgent imperative. It's an urgent imperative. As I said last week, how many newscasts do we have to see before we figure out that it, the time for straddling the fence is gone? The time for telling God, uh, hang on, I'll obey your commandments later after I, my, I, I build up my IRA sufficiently. Hang on, yes, I, I, I know what you said, but that's not really the way our world works. And so I'm going to have to go along with our world, at least for a while, until my deathbed, and then I'll, then I'll come over. No, the time for that kind of mocking of God is long past, and the world struggles and suffers and dies as a result of all the people who mock God in all of their ways. Sinful me, sinful all of us. And the world calls us to mock God. And if anyone says, keep God out of politics. No. The truth of God belongs in every space in this world, in every human interaction, in everything we do and think and feel. The truth of God belongs there, teaching us, nurturing us, calling us back to righteousness. And the scripture says, if you do what is right, then you will be righteous people. But we cannot claim, we cannot rely on the promise of forgiveness to ignore our responsibilities to be ethical people in this world and the ethical commandments of Jesus the Christ, the ethical commandments of the apostles do not mean simply that you smile and say please and thank you to your next door neighbor or that you're polite to the bank teller the demands of God are, in fact, that we recreate this world 
to bring it more in alignment with the kingdom of God, the demand of God is that not just that we pray and privately think, privately hope for the resurrection, but that we pave a way in the desert for our God. And so there is nothing about human life, nothing about society or politics or economics or art or religion. There is nothing which belongs outside the commandments of God, the requirements of God, the truth of God. We cannot be neutral. It doesn't work. To be neutral is to be on the side of evil. So I want to tell you something that I, something else I learned in my boxing time. I was practicing one day with the, at, at, the, at the Supreme Team ring, and I wasn't very good. I was never very good. I was already 30 years old by the time I started. I have short, shorter arms than I really should for my weight. And so I never was very good, but it was fun. But I was never very good. Well, the coach named Milton. Uh, there was somebody that we were getting, helping to get ready for um, the USA boxing fight. And, uh, and the coach said, oh, prof they, my, nick my nickname in the ring was Professor. <laughs> they thought it was hysterical that somebody who t was a professor at a university was boxing with them. Um, so they nicknamed me Professor. He said, hey, Professor, get in the ring. And I said, holy cow, that guy is way better than me. I'm nowhere near able to put up, to, to put up any kind of, I, I would just, I would just be, be awful. I couldn't possibly do that. And you know what he said? Baseball fans, right? We have baseball fans here. He said, step up. He said, step up to the plate. In other words, worthy or not, ready or not, it's time to step up. Go in and be the person you have called to be, even though we're not quite ready and we're not quite able, and even though we're going to fail, and I took a lot of punches from that guy, and it doesn't matter, step up to the plate, he said. And so my question for this world is, as it gets, seems to descend into more and more chaos, as there is more and more homelessness and poverty, as there is more and more violence and crime, more prisons, more hunger, more disease, I cannot be neutral. And it's time to step up to the plate. Step up to the plate. The Holy Spirit says to me, you cannot stand on the sidelines anymore. I'm mixing my metaphors here, but you get it. Boxing, football, and baseball, they're all mixed up. But the Holy Spirit says, you cannot stand on the sideline anymore. You have to play. You have to. And that means you have to step up to the plate and do what is right and make this world a different place, even when it's inconvenient for your individual retirement account, even when it's inconvenient for your political perspective, when it doesn't match the way you really want to vote. Too bad, step up to the plate, make a choice. We cannot be neutral anymore. Amen.